When someone asks you what the worst NASCAR race of all time is, what comes to mind? Is it a race that features tragedy? A bad wreck? Major controversy? Was it a race that is considered flat-out boring? Was it that one race in 1956 that got canceled? Honestly, in terms of cup alone, there are plenty of choices that there probably isn't a definitive answer. What about a more specific question like, What's the worst truck series race of all time? A few 2009 truck races could be considered, as well as quite a few between 2019 and today. But honestly, the correct answer is probably the 2000 Fall Texas race. Apologies to Brian Reffner. And no, Andy Houston winning would not have made the race better because reasons. But what about Xfinity? Well, for 21 years, there was actually a definitive answer as to what the worst NASCAR Xfinity Series race of all time was. I know that Darian talked about the 1992 Mountain Dew 500, which had the most cautions in any NASCAR race in history, and that is a good pick. And I know some consider the 2006 Martinsville Xfinity race as the worst Xfinity race of all time. A race so bad the Xfinity Series did not go to Martinsville again for another 14 years. And this after not being at that track the prior 12 years. However, for 21 years, the answer as to what the worst NASCAR Xfinity Series race of all time was, was super obvious. This is a race that is not fondly remembered at all. And especially by me. You will not believe all the ridiculousness that happened before, during, and even after the race. It was even worse than what you know of or remember. And the worst part is... I went to this race. Yeah, so this will be interesting reliving this race in all its infamy. So here we go. This is my story of the race that for 21 years was the worst NASCAR Bush Nationwide Xfinity Series race of all time. The 2002 Hardee's 250. Already before the race weekend, there were problems. See, my original intent of going to this race was to see Andy Houston race in the number 92 Herzog car as a successor to Jimmy Johnson in that ride. That's going to be a million dollar question on who wants to be a millionaire whenever it comes back. However, Herzog Motorsports actually used Andy as a placeholder for owner points because the driver they actually wanted was Todd Bodine, who was under contract to the next-to-dead number 66 cup car for Travis Carter. When that ride shut down temporarily, after Vegas back in March, Andy was blindsided by being unfairly released, and Tabine essentially stole his ride. So in terms of me, already off to a bad start. However, things had the potential to improve. In early April, a month before the race, it was announced that the newest driver that I had started rooting for, Johnny Benson, was going to race five races in the Bush Series in the number 31 Whelan car. And the first race among them was Richmond, my home track, and the race I was going to. Okay, I may not get to see Andy, but I get to see Johnny. That's cool. There is this thing, though, that previous to this, the 31 Whelan car was the car that is infamous for this. Steve Park and Larry, Larry Foyt. Foyt. What in the world? Is that Dan Partis? Looks like no, no, Park just, just spun. He just he just lost it. Either something obviously had to break on that car or or something for the car to turn left that hard. He didn't just lose it at that speed. Oh, that's crazy. It's almost like an axle was broke or something for the car to turn like that. Oh, man. yeah, you see the skid mark right there? There's a skid mark right there. That's off. That's off, I believe, Steve's Steve's tire there. Steve took a heavy shot in the uh, driver's side of the car. And you see the safety workers there working with he and Larry Foyt. So Johnny was the fastest in final practice, which was good. But then qualifying was rained out, which was bad. 
Considering the 31 card didn't have owner points, it looked like this was not going to happen after all. Oh well. But my dad and I still went to the race. So dad and I get to the track and watch Cup Series qualifying from turns 1 and 2. The most notable thing that I can vividly remember about it was this. Sadly. Those are giraffe spots on the side of that car. Kevin Grubb. Oh, 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 oh. Holder, buddy. Holder, holder. Those are ooh, still giraffe spots. They're almost concrete spots. Man. Grubb is trying to make his first cup race. Rick Goodwin is the car owner. Car engine and everything, though, is, is leased. Andy Petrie. Andy Petrie's over somewhat acting like team manager. And uh, actually, the RCR Richard Childress Racing number 2 Bush crew is going to crew the car on Sunday. It's just not unusual to see this happen here. Uh, get back in the throttle, start accelerating up out of that corner. You, you really got to pinch the car down off of turn two over there because there's kind of a transition when it comes up on the straightaway, the back end will come around with you. You'll see that over and over again. He did a great job of keeping it out of the fence. That, that exit over there, Daryl, it's a tight exit. I mean, you almost run out of racetrack in a hurry. Oh, yeah. It just kind of the way you come up out of that corner and, and it just kind of dumps the car sideways. So he'll have to go on that first lap of 2163. That's probably going to be a little borderline. Let me say that's a borderline case. And the first-time team has no provisionals. There are three part-time teams trying to make the race. Kevin Grubb, Hermie Sadler. I'm going to get it. No, I'm not. Randy Renfro had a little help. Had a little help from our from one of our Renfro. friends. Uh, yes. Yep. Uh, are the three part-timers trying to make the race? That was the only incident that happened throughout Bud Paul qualifying, and of course it happened to Kevin Grubb. Anyway, afterwards was Cup Series final practice, which we didn't really pay attention to. We basically walked around all the souvenir haulers. Back in the day, every driver had a souvenir hauler. We eventually found Johnny Benson's merch hauler, and I got my first bit of Benson merch to wear. This t-shirt that I still have today, and this hat... Which, unfortunately, years later, someone broke the back of it and I was forced to throw it away. But don't worry, I made up for it with this hat. <laughs> anyway, I also tried to get my dad to buy a picture of Johnny next to his cup car at Flat Homestead for six bucks, but dad said no. But I did get this catalog for free. We got food, I changed into my new Benson merch, and we went into the stands for the bush race. We sat in the middles of turns one and two. Driver intros for the race starts, and Johnny Benson was the first driver announced in the race. Turns out he got into the race via the past Champions Provisional. So cool! I do get to see one of my guys race. The only other notable driver intro announcement at the time in this race was Ricky Hendrick, who was making his return to the Bush Series after sitting out six races due to a shoulder injury. Unfortunately, the new merch and driver intros was the highlight of the night, because now it was time for the race. The race didn't even begin yet, and we already have problems. Who's against the fence at turn two? For Pete's sake, the 49 of Troy Klein spun out on one of the pace laps. I tell you what, I've seen that happen here. You come out of the pit, they blew this track off uh, right after the Winston Cup practice. You come out of the pit, you got sticker tires on. You run up on that racetrack, and the track's a little dirty. A lot Carl's been around with car, you. You can see a lot of the debris. It's still down the inside of the track. Yeah, he damaged that car. He's going to have to come to pit road. So Troy Klein and the number 49 crashed in turn two under the pace laps. I honestly do not remember that happening. Now the race begins. Green to the inside. Is there room? No. Yeah, there is now. Yes. <laughs> I think this Frank felt his presence. Scott Riggs in the 10 car, he tried to stay right with Jeff Green. He don't want to give the bottom of that racetrack up. Randy LaJoy in the 7 car. Whoa, whoa. Trouble. Riggs gets into it. Randy LaJoy all the way to the bottom. He's going to pick up the lead after doing that. Let's start over, y'all. Oh, no. This is why the place is packed. Three wide. Six under a blanket into turn one. Well, I think what happened there, Riggs realized that he made a mistake. He tried to let the Green get the car straightened up and almost caused a big wreck. Jeff Green, Randy LaJoy, here comes Biffle on the inside. It's about as an impatient start as I've seen in quite some time. Everybody was poking and gouging. That's the kind of start that sells tickets. Yes, it is. 
kind of start to get your heart beating. Whoa, look at the Here we go. again. Back we down there. Oh, oh, hang on, rest. Hang on to a Randall. Oh, he's running out of racetrack down there. He's going to give up about three or four positions all the way back to fifth in the middle of three and four. How many laps is this race anyway? <laughs> Somebody forgot to tell him there was a zero on in that 20 cow. That's like a heat race. And Jack Sprague, our pole sitter, is back to 12th. And, oh, it, gosh. and I'm not promoting, I'm not promoting anything, but just think if, if this was the Winston, that's what it reminded me of, yeah. like a restart on one of the Winston. Jason Keller, he's going to take the position away from Jeff Green, getting into turn three. This car has not been run since Phoenix of 2000, was a backup car all last year. Well, that was a heck of a start. Jeff Green led the first two laps before Jason Keller took over the lead. After a few laps, the field kind of calmed down. Mark Green spun, but there was no caution. But the first caution of the race came out on lap 13. Just to follow up a little bit, if it's somebody else, not a teammate or a friend necessarily, they can't, they're not going to tell you. Whoa, oh, Sprague! Yeah, Sprague around. Two. Pow! The wall. Caution is that. Hold it up there. Hold it up there. Oh. Caution is out. Spin two. Be clear when you get there. Just look for liquid coming out. Just look for liquid. You know, Sprague was just in trouble from the get-go. He's been backing up, backing up, backing up, hung up on the outside. That was inevitable. And that's our point leader coming into this race. Any one of five drivers could leave here with the point lead tonight. Car's got quite a bit of damage on it. There goes, ooh, man, somebody just ran over one of his little bars, Nerf bars, out from under the rear bumper there. Did Kevin Grubb make contact? Yeah, he's down on the apron. What happened was he got down on the apron, Grubb did, slid up into Sprague. I don't know that he hit him, but he forced him up. And that apron's a little different transition in the racetrack. You get down there too far, it'll shoot you back up the racetrack. Got to believe he probably nerfed him. We've run 12 laps. Why does it feel like 50? I don't know. I'm out of breath. <laughs> I'm glad we got a caution. Let's settle down here now. Let's take a deep breath, settle down, and uh, we got a long way to go. Jack Sprague spun out right in front of me after Kevin Grubb's car got loose underneath Sprague's. Sprague, Andy Kirby, and Johnny Sutter all pitted under that caution. The restart was on lap 20, as the commentators made note of it being a full moon night. The 2000 Texas Trek race was also under a full moon, so that makes sense. However, the most notable thing from this race happened on lap 24. Oh, trouble. Big trouble. Oh, oh, oh. hard hit. And that was Johnny Benson hard into the wall at turn three. And Brian Vickers in the 40 car. Johnny Benson had already made his way up to about the 27th position after starting 43rd. Boy. I tell you, Benson hit that wall hard, forcing it right side. That car spun around and took off. You just don't realize, folks, you're doing 140 miles an hour into that third turn on this little racetrack. You're going to have some heavy impact. Not a lot of room to buff off speed. Benson, fastest in practice in both Bush and both Winston Cup final sessions, moving around in the car. Ted Marsh out of Madison, Connecticut. Same Owns car that car. Steve Park drove last year on a yep. number of occasions. We talked about the benefits of running the Bush race. This is the opposite. You got it. And I tell you, he's moving around slowly in that car. I know he's moving around. That's good news, but he's mighty gingerly in there right now. So rookie driver Brian Vickers wrecks Johnny Benson. And you're probably wondering how I reacted to this. Well, the crash was in turns three and four. I was in turns one and two. I couldn't immediately tell it was actually him. I saw the red and white on the car, but I couldn't tell who it was. I initially thought it was Lyndon Amick in the number 26 Dr. Pepper car, but then I saw him go by on track. I then started tracking which cars came by to figure out which one did not. Then I noticed the 31 did not go by and figured out, oh no, it's Benson. Well, great. Not even 30 laps in and Johnny gets crashed out. Surely this couldn't get any worse, right? Right? Well, what the TV audience saw that I at the track did not was... Johnny Benson took his time climbing out of the uh, Ted Marsh-owned Whalen Chevy, but looks like Johnny is okay. Well, I tell you, he's, got a, he's had his bail run, though. He's just kind of taking his time, and, uh, you know, he's not, he's not jumping up and down by any means. No. It was a hard hit, Darrell. It really was, and I tell you, it, 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 it could do a number of things. Uh, shoulder injury comes to mind when it throws you to the right when that car crashes into the wall. So uh, a mild concussion, a number of things come to mind.
As Johnny was going into the ambulance, Greg Biffle made a pit stop for some adjustments and to stop an overheating issue. The restart was on lap 32, which, like the previous restart, Fox also missed. Brad T goes to the garage, supposedly for a vibration, and ends his night. Josh Richardson's night also ends early right after that, thanks to this. Two cars, Christian Elder, turn two. I said, that's, that's Mark Green, actually. I'm sure you're right. Yeah, that, that, car. Elder usually drives that car. Oof, that is Josh Richardson. And he is, I could make a joke with Smuckers there, but it wouldn't be kind because the back end of that car is gone. No, and to follow up what I said about his dad, he's the crew chief on the 66 car, and he is one of the, uh, he's Brett Bodine's nephew. And I'm sure that 11 car probably came out of Brett's stable. That's, does that say Uncrushables in the back? I believe it does. False advertising. Oh, Uncrustables. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, more on that later, Mike. Anyway, Josh almost gets hit by leader Jason Keller as Josh was unable to continue after getting crashed by Mark Green. Not Christian Elder, Mike. And again, this was right in front of me, as was this when Josh showed his displeasure towards Mark Green. Larry Hicks, who saved Jack Roush after a plane crash a couple weeks prior during the Talladega weekend, was at Richmond that night and was interviewed. You've heard the name Larry Hicks a lot in the last two weeks. That's the man that pulled Jack Roush from that air crash in Alabama. Time to meet the man who we feel is a real hero, Steve Burns. Boy, Mike, and it is an honor to meet retired Sergeant Major Larry Hicks. First of all, on behalf of everybody, thank you for saving Jack Roush's life. And tell us about your experience here at the racetrack. I'll tell you, it's been awesome. I, I, it's like I told everybody before, I've never been to a, a NASCAR race ever. So my wife and I both were kind of in, in awe of all this. It's, it's really exciting. It's, it's nice to be here. Everybody's been so nice about it. Now, Larry, a, a lot of people have described you as a hero, and you don't want any part of that, but we think you are. No, sir, I don't feel comfortable with that. That's just something that, I thought, like I've said before, I think any Marine would do. Have you had a chance to talk to Jack Roush personally? Yes. I spent the day with him Sunday in the hospital, and uh, very emotional, very gracious man. Uh, very impressed by him and his whole family. It's, it's, been, it's been really nice. Well, sir, thank you once again for saving Jack Roush's life, and thank you for uh, defending our company's freedom as a United States Marine. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you having us. The, the short story is that Roush was flying an experimental airplane, flew it into a power line, crashed in a pond, landed upside down in eight feet of water. Hicks was at his home, jumped in his boat, rowed out into the pond, and on his third dive, pulled Jack Roush to the surface, administered CPR. Save his life? Yeah, he said six months ago he couldn't have done that because he was on chemo. He's, he's battling cancer himself. And six months ago he wouldn't have been strong enough to have dove in the water and pulled somebody out. So Jack Roush has somebody watching after him. They got that. The Lord has something else planned for Jack Roush. Being at the track, I actually did not know Larry was there that night. So that was pretty cool of him to be there. The restart that Fox did not miss this time was on lap 46. The next caution was five laps later for the biggest wreck of the night. They ran this Bush race in order to do well in the Winston Cup race tomorrow. A big wreck on the speedway. And more at turn three. Two more cars. Todd Bodine in the wall. And is that Jeff Green crashed there with him? Yes, it is. A 21 oh. car. What, well, fellas, what in the world is going on, man? I'll tell you one thing. We don't need restrictor plates to have the big one. Because we oh, just had it again. Around. All the way around. There you go. Come on. Up, up. That 92 oh. car is demolished. 21 yeah. car is as well. The 21 is. I just looked up, watching the wreck off of two, as uh, Dick was giving that report. And I looked down there and they're wrecking in three. Having an engine issue, Tony Raines gets spun out by Brandy LaJoy, and right behind that at the same time, Tim Sauter was spun by Shane Meal in a chain reaction situation. Jeff Purvis runs into Raines, and Casey Mayer spins himself to avoid any major damage. Shane Hall also wrecks right behind all of that. Meanwhile, at the exact same time, right in front of all that, Tom Bodine flat out runs over Jeff Green, and they both crash out. Bodine crashing out made me happy, because to 11-year-old me, that was some sort of vindication for Andy Houston, because Andy would not do that. That's what you get, Bodine! However, my excitement for Bodine crashing out was short-lived. 
If you noticed the very beginning of this clip, you would have noticed this guy. Before the big one of the night occurred, this guy gave an update regarding one of the other drivers from a previous caution. Now, Johnny Benson, we saw, was a little slow climbing from his car. His Ted Mar Chevy there at turn three. Here's Dick Bergeron with more. Well, he walked into the care center, Mike, but they put him in the back of the ambulance. Ed Green from the Speedway will give us a statement. How's Johnny doing? He's doing okay. He's been taken by ground transportation to Memorial Regional Medical Center here in Richmond. He has some bruised ribs, possible concussion. He's being taken there for x-rays and a CAT scan. And they ran this bush race in order to do well in the Winston Cup race tomorrow. A big wreck on the Speedway. So as the big one happened, the TV audience found out about Johnny Benson being transported to Memorial Regional, which is just a few miles away from the track for further examination after Brian Vickers wrecked him earlier in the race. Now you're probably wondering how I found out about that at the track. Well, the person sitting right behind me was listening to the radio broadcast and after the big one happened, the radio audience got the same update the TV audience did. This person then noticed my Benson merch I was wearing and decided to tap me on the shoulder and tell me that Johnny was going to the hospital for potential broken ribs. Now, I'm 11 years old at this point. I didn't know a thing about the technical terms for the names of bones and stuff quite yet. I only knew the basics of the human body. Head, neck, chest, heart, stomach, arms, legs, butt, you know, the basics. I didn't know what ribs were. And this is how pessimistic I've come to know myself to be today, even back then. I pondered that info under that caution for the big one. What's a rib? And eventually I had convinced myself that ribs were vertebrae. That's right. Pessimistic and overworrying 11-year-old me convinced myself that Brian Vickers broke Johnny Benson's neck. Uh, yeah. And would you believe me if I told you that wasn't even the worst misdiagnosis goof regarding Johnny Benson and his health that night? Uh, yeah, I'll explain that later. Anyway, back to the race now. The restart was on lap 65. The two dominant drivers of the race, Jason Keller and Bobby Hamilton Jr., were battling for the lead, and Hamilton Jr. took over the lead on lap 76 as Jason Keller falls back to take care of a glowing brake rotor issue. Shane Meal pits under green. Casey Kane, yes, that Casey Kane, almost hits the wall but saves it. However, that was not the case for Kerry Earnhardt, who got loose and crashed on lap 102, bringing out the fifth caution of the race, ending one of the longest green flag runs of the night. Kerry Earnhardt has brought up the fifth caution here at lap 102. Spun getting into turn one and pounded the wall at turn two. Leaders making pit stops. Yes, Brad Shaw, that is your car. And it is hurt. Jimmy Spencer's got trouble on pit road. He, he he had a good pit stop, but now he's backing back up into his pit box. I don't know what in the world's going on. He's got all kinds of problems. Go, still, go. still on the lead Everybody. lap here. It looks as though the car is down on the right rear over here, or down on the something is the right rear. Yeah, Dick Bergman. Well, this is something I've never seen in all the years I've been at auto racing. This car has dropped to the back end, and he has broken the rear end. He thinks in half. Jimmy Spencer, a shot to win the race. The rear end of the car has come apart. Look, look at how well, the car is just laying on the ground. I mean, I, when he started to drive away, I said, it looks like the car is too low. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 broke, it's broke something. And that, you can see some fluid right here that's uh, apparently it's broken the rear end housing in two. Well, that was the best car here. I mean, this was routine four-tire stop. Let's watch when the jack drops. Right there, oh, yeah, right there. You can see the rear end broke. See the wheel there wobbling the right rear, just like the rear end housing broken too. Oh no. Uh-oh, somebody's holding up a part. Yeah, yeah, there's the telltale sign piece right there. Wow, that's a shame. He had a good race car. Well, we're going to be under caution a little because they're going to have to tow that car away. Jimmy's out of it. So Jimmy Spencer, who had won the previous two Richmond Bush races to this one, had some sort of bizarre rear-end issue with the car, not himself, which turned out to be a broken right rear U-bolt. His car, along with Kerry Earnhardt's in turn two, were both towed to the garage. 
Also under this caution, a bizarre penalty happened to Greg Biffle, and honestly, I wasn't sure for exactly what. Either way, he had to restart 23rd on the restart instead of 5th. Said restart happened on lap 111, but the green did not stay out for very long. Trouble. Rick, turn two. Boy, that, that started going into turn one. Kenny Wallace and uh, the 19 car, a couple of guys were all down in there three wide. And, and it's Lyndon Amick who ends up against the fence. Amick was on the outside. He was kind of like odd man out. Nobody got a lap back or one of their lap backs. That started coming down the front straightaway here. They got three wide. That granted what we were talking about, funneling down into turn one. Kenny Wallace got down on the inside. And he ran down in the corner and he forced a couple of cars up and uh, caused a big wreck. Here's Kenny down here. 19 car in the middle. The 19 car doesn't have much room there. Kenny clips him. That gets Kenny loose and into the Amick he goes. Clipped Amick and then bounced up into, or clipped, uh, clipped Ashton Lewis and then bounced up into Amick. Kenny was going down in there really fast. See, so gets tight. Ashton Lewis. A bottleneck three-wide chain reaction situation between four different cars resulted in Kenny Wallace, who may or may not have gotten help from Tim Sauter, hitting Lyndon Amick and crashing Amick out of the race. The restart was on lap 123, but once again, that didn't last very long. You know, it's funny, we're halfway. This race still hasn't oh, settled Scott, down. Oh, somebody oh. around down there. Casey Kane. Who climbed you. the hill up there earlier, and this time he pounds it. They just cannot get in there three wide, and it's just there's not yeah, enough room, and you got to give and take right there, and there's just not any giving going on. Seventh caution. The young Robert Yates protege. It's out the seventh caution in turn two. Uh, left front. Mike, it's, it's, corner. it's just the way that turn is, the, the way you swing out to get down in that corner. And, and if somebody can drive in under you, they're there, but you're coming down. And so you make contact. It's no wonder that that turn two grandstand is one of the more well-packed areas here. It don't look like there's an empty seat down there in one or two anywhere. I just don't think there's a preferred place to wreck tonight to wreck it everywhere. We have got a crowd here for this bush race. 13 cars in the garage already, and the 98 will be the 14th. Well, it's hard to see what happened from that angle. Yeah, it just looked like he was he was loose right there. Whether he got any help, I don't know, but here we go. No, no he just he just turned down in the corner. You carry a lot of speed down in there, and the car must just have been a little free with him. Round she goes. At the halfway point, turn two claims another driver as Casey Kane crashes out. This caution saves Randy LaJoy as he had a right rear tire going down. Meanwhile, the Greg Biffle penalty from a couple cautions ago was explained. And we have an update on the Greg Biffle penalty. Biffle was uh, sent to the, to the back of the field on the prior restart because of where the teams placed the tires that came off the car on his stop. Uh, that they were placed outside well, of the, the half of that pit car. Yeah, before go, the car can You'll leave, all the equipment, tires, air wrenches, everything has to be at least to the half of the pit box closest to the pit wall before the car can leave. It's called the outside half of the pit box tire violation. That's what the official explaining right here. Radar. See? Right there. Look at it, dude. You can't measure That's that. The restart was on lap 132, and once again, Fox missed it. As Kevin Grubb was about to set up a pass on Jamie McMurray for position, a debris caution flew. Debris over in turn three. And that'll bring out the eighth caution of the night at lap 147. Many parts have been flying around. It doesn't surprise me a little debris laying here and there. Well, Larry, 100 laps to go. Yeah, just looking when the leaders were all in on about lap 101, and we've... Uh, we ran oh, a good uh, 14 laps of caution. Boy, I, I don't know. If, if I can't make it on fuel, I'm going to probably come on in and get the, go, those four fresh tires and make sure I can make it then. But I just the safest place in this race is out front. 
If I think I can make it, and I'm gonna bet you Scott Wimmer in a 23 car, those guys can make it because they always are the fuel mileage kings. I don't know if I'm gonna give up that track position no more laps than I have on my tires right here. Well, I don't know. I think I'd come down 100 laps to go get me four tires and get ready to rock and roll. The Reister was on lap 154, but once again... It looked like Ashton Lewis going around. About three big spins and, and see, a catch. See all that smoke? That's that sealer. That's what we were talking about. Now, here comes the 19 car. Is he going to get his lap back finally? I, I believe, believe he, he is. Will. Looks like Going to get yeah. one of them. Here comes Shane Meal, and he Ooh. may have made it. Looks. Gordon score monitor Shane Mill did not get his I don't back, but Tim Sauter in the 19 did get back. That'll right. put him back on the lead lap. And that's good for him because, like I said, he's got a decent car. Ashton now, Lewis is dizzy. Ashton Lewis Jr. spins out on the front stretch, maybe or maybe not because of Kenny Wallace, to which Ashton says it was Kenny's fault, but to me the footage is inconclusive. And I have no idea how Mark Green avoided him. The restart was on lap 161. With Bobby Hamilton Jr. still leading and dominating the race, this was basically the cool-down period of the race as this stint was the race's longest green flag run of the race at 42 laps. The racing was so good all the way around, with notable underdogs like David Rudiman, who was making his NASCAR debut, Butch Miller, and Kevin Grubb all getting shout-outs. However, the green flag stint ended with this. Turn three, excuse me, Larry, Mark Green... I think the engine might have gone up. A lot of flames yeah, it's, from the it's, back it's, of that car. And the caution will be out. Caution is out. Something erupted in that bad boy. I hope there's no fluid over there because it looked like that was oil. The car slowed dramatically in the back stretch, and then there was a lot of flame. And then he may have shut it down. I think he did. And that's the caution that everybody was looking for. Yeah, and what a dilemma those guys are faced with. Now, let's look at the replay right here. This is looking out of Stacy Compton's car. I'm happy that you can see the sparks and, and the smoke flying out from under the 38 car. Stacy just runs in the back of him because all of a sudden he stops. You see, it looks like a transmission or a gear or something may have let go in that Something thing. definitely let go big time. You can see the oil fire out the back of the car. So Mark Green's night finally comes to an end, and now I wonder why Darian hasn't done a second worst Xfinity Series season video on that 38 car in 2002 yet. Yeah. The restart was on lap 210, but you guessed it. Crash. Riggs got collected and into the fence hard. Mark. Caution is out. Ten, okay? Ten cars crashed. I'm okay. Said he's okay. It That's was good news. Kenny Wallace who got together with Riggs. But that was just a, it Very was a wad way. back there, Daryl. Oh, yeah. Well, Everybody's like trying to move forward all at the same time. That's the only thing about new tires, old tires, and, and the difference in the cars. Just like Larry said, he got on old tires. He's like, a, he's crippled a little bit. He can't go everywhere he needs to go. And especially the guy on new tires running all over the back of him. There was contact between Kenny Wallace and, and Scott Riggs, but see, they're all bundled up in front of Riggs as well. Watch the second yellow car in your picture and the third one right there. Yeah, Scott ran up on the back of that uh, blue and white car in front of him. I couldn't tell which car that was. I think he had to check up when he did. Kenny got in the back of him. Randy LaJoy slows up for some reason, which caused Scott Riggs to slow down in front of Kenny Wallace. This results in Riggs crashing out. Why Riggs was mad at Kenny, I don't know, because Randy LaJoy's car technically was the cause of that wreck. The final restart of this race was on lap 222. The two dominant drivers, Jason Keller and Bobby Hamilton Jr., battled for the win. It looked like after some time, Bobby Jr. would get his first career win in the Xfinity Series. That was until 11 to go when Jason Keller managed to pass Bobby Jr. for the lead. Right after that happened, though, the engine in Bobby Jr.'s car lets go, prompting him to fall out of the race. With Jason Keller now ahead of Ashton Lewis Jr. by about two seconds, this chaotic and attrition-filled race had an anticlimactic ending, as Jason Keller just cruised on to victory. How Ashton Lewis Jr. finished second after spinning with less than 100 to go, I'll never know. How Brian Vickers finished seventh at all, I'll never know. Only 24 of the 43 cars finished the race, which was a record for attrition for a Richmond Bush race. So that was the end of the 2002 Hardee's 250.
a race full of chaos, attrition, controversy, anger, and even a driver getting injured because of an inept rookie, who by some miracle finished seventh. But by no means was that the end of the ridiculousness of this race. Oh no! There were quite a few more wrinkles to a certain part of this race. Oh goody. So, obviously the most notable thing that came from all this madness was the fact that Johnny Benson did suffer three broken ribs on the left side after Brian Vickers wrecked him. The biggest thing that happened as a result of this was a very interesting chain reaction between Johnny, Joe Nemechek, and Jerry Nadeau. The crash and subsequent injuries caused Johnny to miss the 2002 Pontiac at 7400 the following night, and then the day after that after a rain delay. After his number 26 car for Travis Carter was sidelined after Fontana the previous week and wasn't revived until it came back at Dover with, guess who, Tom Bodine as the driver. Seriously? Joe Nemechek was the emergency sub for Johnny in that race, and Joe finished a very respectable 12th place. Before the next event, the All-Star Race, Nemechek and Jerry Nidu would have their rides swapped. Joe Nemechek got the 25th car for Hendrick, and Nadeau became Benson's sub until his return at Pocono. Seriously, Johnny? Pocono? I would not have recommended that. Either time. Anyway, the second thing that happened was probably the most hate Mike Joy ever got in his entire career prior to the Keyboard Warriors meltdown of 2023. So remember when Mike Joy said he wasn't going to make a dumb joke in regards to the Josh Richardson crash because it wouldn't have been kind, and then he makes a dumb joke anyway because he thought the word uncrustable said uncrushables instead? Well, it turns out that wasn't even Mike's worst joke of the weekend. Oh, no. The cup race was rain-delayed part of the way through. During an interview, Michael Waltrip was talking about his brother Daryl eating ribs for some reason, which, you guessed it, Leads to Mike Joy saying a pretty bad and tasteless joke. Every angle, DW, eating them ribs, man, all morning long or all afternoon long. I'm, I was impressed by that. You know, you get comfortable with your surroundings. You start liking the way things are looking. You, you start to eat. And uh, before you know it, DW, pounds are going to come around. That's why I stay so thin. I don't know what's next for me. You never can tell. <laughs> they've got ribs in the hotel. They've got ribs up in the booth. They've got ribs everywhere. Whoa, Sterling just ribbed me, and I'm it's a little lower than I was comfortable with. A uh, little ribbing going on. Let's do some more ribbing, guys. Well, maybe we can uh, maybe we can send one to Johnny Benson. Understand he, he needs one. Needs a rib. <laughs> Since that joke didn't go anywhere, we'll go to Dick Bergeron. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to think if that's funny or not. Ah, it wasn't. Never mind. Yeah, okay. When Daryl Waltrip, who laughs at everything, is it laughing at your joke? It's a pretty bad joke. This was before the days of social media, but I bet if social media was a thing in 2002, Mike Joy would have been chewed out and roasted over the coals big time over that. It would make the keyboard warriors meltdown look like a non-issue. But even then, that wasn't close to the most WTF part of this entire thing. There is yet something else that happened that was actually worse. So, remember when I told you that 11-year-old pessimistic-minded me convinced myself that ribs were in the neck and not the chest because I didn't know the technical names of bones yet and stuff, but yet that wasn't the worst misdiagnosis goof regarding Johnny and his health that night? Well, remember the guy who told the TV and radio audiences that Johnny was going to the hospital and one of the concerns was a possible concussion? Well, the good news was Johnny did not suffer a concussion in that wreck. Though, given how he looked when he got out of the car, the concern was justified. The bad news was, the hospital doctors one-upped both a knowing pessimistic 11-year-old me and the infield care center medics in terms of misdiagnosing something in regards to Johnny. This story is so ridiculous and unfathomable that Johnny himself has to tell the story. Yeah, there's so uh, Richmond, of course, we, uh, Steve Park, I think at that point in time was hurt. So um, uh, that was a wheeling yeah. uh, sponsor car at that point in time. And they asked me to run that race. And I says, yeah. And, and it, yeah, we're running good. And we, we got wrecked. And, 
hit the wall in a very wrong, bad way. And so I said, yeah, I spent the night in the hospital. But um, they did a, bu a bunch of checking. I had had a, I broke some ribs, but they showed a shadow on my aorta. So they went, they, I went through, I couldn't tell you how many tests all night. On your heart? Yeah, they, yeah, really? showed a, I didn't uh, know that. Wow. a shadow there. I remember the doctor, Dr. Wolfgang, he comes in there and he say, hey, I'm Dr. Wolfgang. And I said, he, he goes, I'm a vascular surgeon. And I go, Yep, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> and he's like, no. And then he explained, cause it, which made sense now, because I did a CT scan, and then I come back. And like 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, I'm going again. Look at a nurse. I said, where, where are we going? CT scan. I go, huh. Of course, they gave me some stuff by now. I think it's just deja vu. I said, it doesn't make any sense. Well, they sent me for a second one within within 20 minutes. Oh, wow. And I thought, okay, this is odd. Yeah. And then when he came in, he said, well, we're going to do another test. So then they, I, I call it the garden hose they put down your throat to, to go in there and, and check that. And and then they says, well, we got, we're, we're two for three. Only, only one showed good, the other two still in bad. And so then a little later, a guy come in and he says, what are you doing? It's like, right now it's like three in the morning. Uh, nothing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so the, he goes, well, I'm gonna try something. They put So then they put me in a MRI and I sat in that for like an hour or something. And then they come back out and they says, oh, you're good, you can go home. I go, what? We went through all this. He says, oh no, that's either good or bad. There are no in between. Oh wow. So once they're yeah. satisfied, they go, you can go home. And I says, well, can I at least spend another couple hours here? <laughs> <laughs> and so the, um, I, I forget what time it was I got up in the morning, and then I went back over to the track. I could barely move, but um, so, and, and it, to be honest, I'm not sure who drove the car. I think uh, I think either Nadu, I know Nadu ran uh, later, so I think uh, J uh, Jerry Nadu got in the car. And so I watched the race there, and I, I went to the track, so I, I, so I was still there watching, helping, doing everything I could. I couldn't drive the car, but did everything I could to, um, to get Jerry through that part. So let me see if I got this right now. My local hospital, who was treating the driver who ended up becoming my all-time favorite, who is there because of broken ribs, somehow looked at the CT scan they took of Johnny and thought he had a bad heart. What? How does that happen? I couldn't even begin to imagine what Johnny's thought process through all of that would have been. <sighs> Thankfully, that was debunked and a half. And even better, I do remember the name Dr. Wolfgang as my grandmother went to Bon Secours, what us locals call Memorial Regional, a few times when she started having heart issues a couple years after this occurred. I literally asked my mom who it was that performed the open heart surgery on grandma. Spoiler alert, it was not Dr. Wolfgang, it was another doctor, Dr. Ball. But the fact this happened to my favorite driver at my local hospital... Yeah, that was a bit unnerving to find out. There is no way that Johnny or NASCAR would have heard the end of it if that was actually a thing. <sighs> but somehow, even through all of this madness that this race created before, during, and even after the race had ended, there actually was one good moment that came from this race. And that part was in relation to me. So, remember when before the race I got my first pieces of Johnny Benson clothing, the hat and the t-shirt, but my dad said no to the $6 picture? Well, as we were going back to dad's truck to go home after the race, we neared Johnny's merch hauler, which was still open. And I had told my dad about what the fan behind me told me regarding Johnny going to the hospital after that wreck and that he was injured. After a couple minutes, dad finally relented and bought me the picture. As for where that picture is today, it's right here. 
That's right. The picture that my dad bought for me for six bucks at my home track, Richmond Raceway, after Brian Vickers injured Johnny Benson at a race I went to, is the exact same picture that Johnny Benson himself personally autographed for me 19 years later at his home track, Berlin Raceway. Yeah, this picture's been around and definitely has an interesting backstory to it. <laughs> That was literally the only good thing about this race. <sighs> For 21 years, the 2002 Hardy's 250 was the worst race in NASCAR Bush Nationwide Xfinity Series history. That race had that dubious distinction until the 2023 Raptor King of Lame 250. The god-awful spring Atlanta Xfinity train wreck atrocity, which basically had everything the 2002 Hardy's 250 had, and then some. At the very least, the 2002 Hardy's 250 had some excitement, tried to have good racing, had a popular winner, and did not have a controversial ending. Anticlimactic, yes, but at least it wasn't controversial. The 2023 Raptor King of Lame 250 can't even claim any of that. Literally, the only positive thing I can say about the 2023 Raptor King of Lame 250 is, thank God for Josh Williams. Still, despite being dethroned from the top spot, the 2002 Hardy's 250 is still, in fact, one of the worst NASCAR Bush Nationwide Xfinity Series races of all time.